All right, so last time we left off, we've talked about echinoderms, yes? So class character, or phylum characteristics for echinoderms, what are they? Contamorous symmetry. symmetry, good. Tough skin with spines, good. Hedgehog. Pedicillaria, good. Water vascular system. Good, and one last one. Regenerative abilities. Okay, good job. Okay, so this time we're going to go over the different echinoderm classes and then we're going to talk about form and function in echinoderm, so how they carry out the seven essential functions. Um, so this picture represents the five different classes of echinoderm. Um, you are going to need to know the five different classes of echinoderms and the class characteristics, just like you need to know, needed, need to know it for mollusks and arthropods. Um, so like before, I would suggest that you kind of like make a chart, list it out, all right, with phylum echinodermata, all the characteristics, and then the different classes. Um, but here's your five classes. You've got Ophiuroidea, which are brittle stars, and basket stars, Echinoidea, which are your sea urchins and sand dollars, Asteroidea, which are uh, sea stars, Crinoidea, which are crinoid feather stars, um, and sea lilies, and then Holothuroidea, which are sea cucumbers. Okay, so Ophiuroidea. Ophir means serpent tail. Oidea is animal. Okay, so these are the serpent tailed animals. So they get their name because their arms are long and skinny and look like a snake. Okay, um, types of things that you'd find in here are brittle stars and basket stars. Here's a couple pictures so that you can see this. So here on the left, that's your brittle star. Okay, and so you can see like this long skinny arm that looks kind of like a snake. Um, and the central disc of that animal is very, very well defined, okay? So the central disc is the center portion of the animal, and you can see right here on this brittle star where the central disc uh, ends and where the arm starts. So the central disc is very well defined, long, skinny, serpent-like arm. Those arms um, can also be dropped very easily to distract predators. So if something's trying to eat that brittle star, that brittle star can drop an arm, and that arm will actually like move, okay, keep moving once it's been dropped um, in order to, and, you know, help out with the name serpent um, tails and um, get it, allow for that arm to get eaten, allow for the brittle star to get away, no big deal for the brittle star because they can grow it back, right, because they can regenerate that arm. Um, they can be suspension or deposit feeders, so they're either going to be like walking around, picking stuff up off the bottom and eating food. Um, that way, or they're going to be um, like basket stars here on the right. They're going to be putting their arms up into the water and capturing food and then bringing it down to their mouth. So this is what a basket star looks like here. Um, the basket star does still have pentamerous symmetry, even though it looks like um, basket stars have pentamerous symmetry. So here's your central disc, and then you can see the five arms that come off, um, and then those branch a lot. Okay, but they still have the pentamerous symmetry. Okay, um, echinoidea. Echino means hedgehog, so these are the hedgehog-skinned animals. Um, and they have very, very obvious spines. So these are going to be things like sea urchins and sand dollars and heart urchins, right? Um, sea urchins, sand dollars, and heart urchins. Characteristics of this class, their shape is going to be much more rounded, okay? Um, Except for like sand dollars, they're going to be more disc shaped, but rounded or disc shaped is what they're going to be like. Um, their spines are very obvious. If you look at a sea urchin, I mean, it's kind of hard to miss the spine. Um, and then they have a special mouth part that's called Aristotle's lantern. And um, they have five teeth. Yeah. So if you look at the underside of an urchin, you'll see there's five teeth. And then inside of that urchin, they actually have um, like this whole complex structure that they use in order to um, like manipulate those five teeth. And it's called Aristotle's lantern, okay? And it's, it's really cool. Um, I'll show you a picture in just a second. So mouth part made of five teeth. They're herbivores. They like to eat kelp. Kelp's their favorite thing to eat, particularly like urchins love kelp. Um, and so they will move around, use those little five teeth to chew on the kelp. Um, if there is no kelp or algae nearby, they will become detritivores and eat whatever they can find that's dead. Okay, so here's some pictures. Urchins, live urchins, uh, sand dollars, 
guys please two pictures of sand dollars. Um, did do you guys see the live sand dollars at the aquarium? Okay, they actually had like a whole tank that was full of live sand dollars. They kind of looked like rocks, yeah. But sometimes they like stand vertically. Do you see that? Some of them were vertical in the water or on the dirt um, to help to capture food. Uh, this is a heart urchin. Okay, can you guess why it's called a heart urchin? Uh, Shaped kind of like a heart, yeah. Um, and then here's Aristotle's lantern. So this picture right here, this is the teeth of the urchin that, un like if you looked at the urchin on underneath, that's what you would see. And then the teeth would be down here. This whole thing right here, that's the structure that's actually up inside of the urchin. So there's all sorts of muscles here, and those are used to manipulate those five teeth to chew on algae, basically. And then the esophagus would run through the hole in the center, up into the stomach of the urchin. Kind of cool, huh? Okay, um, asteroidia, aster means star, so these are the star animals, these are sea stars. All right. Characteristics of this class, they do have tough skin, um, their spines are going to be short, okay, pretty short, um, and actually it may look like they don't have spines for some types of sea stars, but they do, they'll just be kind of more internal, they'll just maybe look a little bit more bumpy, okay. Um, their arms are very, very thick, and it's hard to determine the central disc. So if you look at this picture right here on the left, their arms are much thicker than the brittle star, right? Um, and it's hard to tell where that central disc starts and ends in comparison to the arm. Yeah? Okay. So feeding in sea stars is kind of interesting and different. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, sea stars are carnivores. Um, for the most part. So they'll walk around and they, they really, really, really like to eat bivalves. So things like mussels, scallops, oysters, okay, clams, that sort of thing. Um, so they're going to eat all sorts of stuff like that. They can also be scavengers, so they'll eat like dead fish and stuff like that. But mostly they're going to be eating bivalves. Um, and they have a very interesting way of eating bivalves. Um, so how many of you have ever found like a clam, a live clam or something like that at the beach. Okay, and have you ever tried to open it? Yeah, yeah it's really hard, right? Um, it's like that clam, that little clam is super like suctioned together, right? And it, you can try and get your nail in there and like try and pry it open, but it's really, really, really hard to get open. Um, but sea stars are actually able to eat these guys. And so in order to eat them, they have to get those two shells open, right? In order to be able to get inside the, the good part inside. So what they do is the sea star will actually find their little clam or whatever, uh, muscle. Um, and once they find that little muscle, they kind of wrap their body around that muscle. Uh, and they have two feet with little suction cups on the end. And so they'll suction to the either side of the shell and then they start to pull, okay? And so they're sitting there like pulling on this clam. Um, it's hard, right? So they're like pulling super hard and the clam is like trying to stay closed so that the sea star can't get into it um, and eat it. Um, and they've actually got these two muscles, which on your coloring worksheet you should see the adductor muscles. Okay, so those they use to like close themselves. So the sea star's pulling, clam's trying to stay closed. What happens eventually if you like are super, super like, if you're using your muscles like a lot, what happens to them? Say what? They cramp, they get tired, right? And so um, eventually the clam, its muscles get tired, and so that little shell opens just a little bit, right? Just like a little tiny sliver, um, that shell will, will open. And that's all the sea star needs, okay? Once that little shell opens just a little tiny bit, the sea star actually takes its stomach, one of its two stomachs, and actually spits it out of its mouth, okay, into the shells of the clam. Okay, so it like takes it out and sticks it into the shells of the clam, digests the clam while it's still inside the shells, kind of slurps up all of the now liquefied clam and then sucks that stomach back into its body. Yeah. So, yeah, it's weird. They stick their stomach out to digest their food and then pull it in um, when it's done. <laughs> well, they don't digest the pearl. So, it was if they're eating an oyster. So, here, this left. This picture on the left right here, this is actually a um, muscle in the grips of a sea star. If you find a sea star that's kind of like all wrapped around something, it's probably wrapped around a muscle or a bivalve. 
This right here on the right is actually a picture from inside a bivalve. So they put like a camera inside a bivalve and then fed it to a sea star and watched and took recordings of what happened. I'm going to show that to you now. Okay, holothuroidea. Holother means animal resembling a plant. So these are the animals that resemble plants, which they do. They resemble the plant, the cucumber. They are sea cucumbers. Okay, characteristics of this class. Their skin is very leather-like. Um, their spines are maybe internal, okay? But the, their body wall on the outside may have external bumps that you're able to see. Um, so their spines are not as obvious. Their body shape is elongated. So if you m imagine taking like a sea star, okay, and then kind of like stretching it out this way, right? That's kind of what a, a sea cucumber is, all right? So here's my little sea star. So take this and add some like tissue in between each of these, right? And then stretch it out this way. You've got a sea cucumber, all right? Does that make sense? So they still have the pentamerous pentaradial symmetry. Um, it's just their body is elongated. So if you look at them like from one end, that's the way that they would have that pentaradial symmetry, okay? So they do have pentaradial symmetry. They're feeding. Um, they can be either deposit or suspension feeders. So if they're suspension feeders, they're actually going to have oral tentacles, um, which are modified tube feet that they will use to like stick into the water and capture food. Um, if they're deposit feeders, they're going to be moving along on the bottom and eating dirt and digesting all that organic matter and then pooping out the sand. Okay, so they're going to be deposit feeders. Um, evisceration is their defense mechanism. So this is weird and crazy. So their defense mechanism, um, when they feel threatened by a predator, is to vomit up their internal organs. It's called evisceration. Um, and basically, when they feel threatened by a predator, they vomit their internal organs up, and the internal organs are sticky, and they taste bad. And so they essentially entangle the predator and um, they taste bad so the predator tastes that and is all like kind of caught up in these internal organs and so the predator can't get the sea cucumber and then they think that the sea cucumber tastes bad because their internal organs taste bad. So that is their defense mechanism. Um, you do have some kinds of sea cucumbers that actually eviscerate every year. So just like once a year, they decide that they're going to vomit up their internal organs. Um, we think it's probably to try and get rid of any sort of like internal parasites that they might have. Okay. They rely on stored energy while they grow new internal organs. It can take um, a while, like a month, a couple months, maybe longer. Just depends. Um, if you find a sea cucumber like at the beach, you can probably make it eviscerate, but don't because, because it takes a lot of energy for them to regrow those internal organs. Um, and so, and then if they actually encounter a real predator that would actually harm them, they don't have that defense mechanism, right, while they're regrowing those internal organs. So don't do it. Be nice to sea cucumbers. Don't make them eviscerate. All right. Okay, crinoidea. These are sea lilies, okay? Um, and feather stars. These guys are kind of cool. Um, they are characterized by long, feathery arms, um, and they are suspension feeders. So here's two pictures. So a feather star is the one on the left, and a sea lily is the one on the right. Sea lilies tend to be deep sea, um, and they perch themselves on outcroppings of rocks underneath the ocean in areas where there are like good currents. And as the currents pass by, all sorts of different things are caught in the current and they pass through these arms and they get stuck in the arms and the sea lily will then take and like pull its arm up to its mouth and eat all of the stuff that's in the water. So they're suspension feeders. Um, feather stars live a lot of times on coral reefs and so at nighttime they'll actually crawl up onto the reef um, and then extend all of these arms into the water to feed. So they're suspension feeders as well. So they're pretty cool. And it's weird, you can see, like, they can swim, but it's like super weird. They use their arms and they're like moving all over the place. It's crazy. Um, if you have the feathered sea star, you can show us a video when you do your presentation. So, um, okay, form and function in echinoderms. 
Uh, we're going to look at sea stars as our representative member. Oh, yeah, the importance of echinoderms in your notes, cross it out. Okay. Um, we're going to skip to form and function. Okay. And then we'll do the importance later. Don't, you can cross it out. There's, it's again in your notes later. Um, representative member is our C star. So we're going to use our C star as kind of like our model as to what, um, how echinoderms carry out the seven essential functions. All right. So their digestive system is pretty cool. Um, they do have like two stomachs. Okay. Um, they have the cardiac and the pyloric stomach. The cardiac stomach is the stomach that they can evert out of their mouth to, to use to digest. Um, the food, and then the pyloric stomach stays inside of their body. They do have a complete digestive system, so mouth to anus, right? Um, their mouth is actually on the bottom, okay? And their anus is on the top, okay? So you have two sides to a, um, to a sea star. You've got the oral side, which is the underside, the side where the mouth is, okay? And the mouth is in the middle, okay? And then the anus is the aboral side, is on the aboral side, so the side that doesn't have a mouth. Um, remember, we talked about that when we talked about jellyfish, right? So you've got the oral and the aboral side. Same thing with echinoderms, oral and aboral side. Um, so food comes in through the mouth, passes through the digestive system, and then waste exits out the top. All right. And then also sea stars have two digestive glands that run down each arm. So if you've got a sea star, it's a total of 10 right? digestive glands that run down each arm that connect to the pyloric stomach. And those digestive glands are going to be secreting stuff like digestive juices to help them um, break down their food. All right? So you'll have um, digestive glands in each arm. Okay. The respiratory system. So sea stars uh, will have some skin gills. So on their, on their uh, skin, they can have little projections that you, when you do your dissection, you'll actually take a sea star a part of the skin and put it under the microscope and see if you can see the skin gills, which you probably will be able to. Um, and so they can have little skin gills that they can use to digest or capture oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. But most of that gas exchange will occur on the tube feet. Okay, so the tube feet run down the center of each arm. Okay, and gas exchange will take, a, take place across the surface of those tube feet. Okay, so you'll get oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide mostly across the tube feet. Um, the circulatory and the excretory systems. So they don't really have separate systems for this. Um, do you guys remember what a coelom is? What? A coelom? Oh, it's just a space. Yeah, space. It's the space between the internal organs and the body wall, right? And it's full of fluid, yes? Okay, so um, they have a coelom, okay? So there is space in between this body wall and the internal organs of a sea star. And there's fluid in there. Um, and that fluid circulates around. Um, there's like little cells in here that have cilia on them that beat and circulate the silomic fluid. Okay. Um, the tube feet will gather the oxygen and then it will place that oxygen into the silomic fluid and the silomic fluid will, cir will circulate around and you will get um, oxygen delivered to all the cells of the sea star. Okay. Any waste products that the cells get gets put into the slow fluid that gets circulated out down to the, like the tube feet and then diffuses out of the tube feet. Okay, so the circulatory and excretory systems they don't really have too much of a like they don't have a separate system for those. Uh, use they use the coelom. Um The digestive glands that we were talking about that you'll actually see in your in your um, dissection those run down each of the arms and those help with circulation as well because they also absorb nutrients and will um, help to distribute those nutrients because they run down each arm. All right, so they help with circulation as well. And they don't have blood, so no blood to them. Their nervous system, they have no head. So there is no head on a sea star. Um, they basically have like a nerve ring that runs around the mouth, and then they've got radial nerves that run down each of the arms. Okay, and then they can have they have sort of like a nerve net kind of thing in each of the arms. Um, and then th at the ends of each of the arms or rays, they've got what's called an eye spot. Okay, and that eye spot can detect light and dark. And then some of the, the tube feet at the ends of each of the arms will be specialized to have like chemical receptors and stuff like that. So if you see a live sea star, a lot of times you'll see like the arms are kind of like up, curled up at the ends and then they've got like little tube feet out. 
what they're doing is like using those little tube feet to sense the chemicals in the water, all right? Um, and what's crazy and weird is that whichever foot or arm detects most strongly prey, that arm kind of like takes over the rest of the sea star. Um, and kind of directs where that sea star goes. So it, it doesn't, the sea star makes no conscious decision of like, hmm, I sense food over here, let's go this way. It's more like, hmm, sensing, sensing, oh, here we go. Like the arm takes over and just pulls it whichever way it senses food. So it's, we don't really know how that works or why it does that, but that's the way it is. So um, it's kind of weird and crazy. Um, so status cysts, they also have status cysts to, det to detect if they're up or down. So they need to be right side up, so they're going to be able to detect that. Um, <clears throat> and then you got the eye slot at the end. All right. Um, their musculoskeletal system. So they have a hydrostatic skeleton, water vascular system that they will use to move. Um, the water vascular system has a bunch of different parts. You've got the madreporite plate which is actually where water can, from the ocean can actually enter into that water vascular system. And you'll see this on your sea star as well, but you can see it on this specimen right here. That's the bald spot on the top, okay? So that little bald spot right there okay, is the madreporite plate. Um, and that's where water is going to enter into the water vascular system. Then you've got a little stone canal, which connects down to the ring canal, which runs around this central disc and then you've got a radial canal that runs down each of the arms okay so it enters here runs around down each arm does that make sense okay i'll pass this around so that you can actually look at this a little bit more closely um please be very careful okay this is a dried starfish so it is delicate so please be careful but look it's kind of cool um okay and then attached to each of those radial canals you have these things called impulae so I'm going to go back a slide to show this to you, and then we'll come back so you can finish your notes, okay? So um, if you look right here, okay, um, this right here would be the radial canal, okay? It's going to run down each arm. Okay, attached to there, you see these kind of like yellow bulb-like things? Yeah? Those are called the ampullae, okay? And then those connect to the tube feet. Um, and here's what I'm going to do. Um, the radial canal is going to distribute the water out and it's going to fill these little ampullae. Um, and remember when we talked about worms and their hydrostatic skeleton, um, can, you can you change the um, like volume of water? No, but you can change the shape, right? Okay, so that sea stars rely on that same property. So the ampullae have little muscles around them and they can squeeze that water. Okay, and when they squeeze the water that's in them, it pushes the water out into the tube foot, and the tube foot will extend. Okay, when those muscles relax, water comes back up, and the tube foot retracts. Okay, and so by squeezing all of these muscles around the ampullae, they can extend or re-extend um, re uh, their tube feet and move around the body. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, they also have an endoskeleton which you will see on your sea star when you do your dissection. Um, and so, but it's not, the skeleton is not actually used for like movement, okay? They use their water vascular system entirely for movement, um, but they do have a skeleton that they will use for protection, okay? Um, and so you can see, it's basically like, they call, they're called dermal ossicles. So they're bones inside the skin, okay? Um, and you'll see those in your dissection. In some kinds of sea stars, those dermal ossicles are actually kind of fused, okay? And what, this is what you get, okay? So these, this is actually like the skeleton of a sea star. Um, and these little bones, these dermal ossicles, have kind of become fused together, okay? Seas, um, sea urchins also have a internal skeleton. It gives them like that round shape here. And you're actually going to look at this under the microscope during your lab. but those dermal ossicles are fused and they form this thing which is called the test of a sea urchin okay so this is the skeleton of a sea urchin all right but this is their dermal ossicles when you look at this you'll actually see there's holes in here for the tube feet to come through so the tube feet actually come through and they use those to move all right so that's the test of a sea urchin their reproductive systems they have separate sexes so you have boy sea stars and girl sea stars, um, and then they do broadcast spawning. 
So they will release their eggs and sperm into the water column, um, and fertilization will be external. They can also, oh, sorry, and then they you have little larvae that eventually develop into your juvenile sea star, which settles down and becomes the adult. Okay? Um, they also can do regeneration, meaning they can regrow lost body parts. Okay, so ecology of echinoderms. Um, sea stars are actually a lot of times in a lot of different ecosystems top predators. So they're, they keep a lot of other populations of things under control. Um, and some things, they're actually a keystone predator, which we'll talk about. Um, so like in the intertidal zone, they are. Um, sea urchins also help to control algae populations. So um, sea urchins can like help to keep the kelp forests um, in balance. But if you get echinoderms out of balance, so like too many urchins or too many sea stars in an area, they can actually throw off the entire ecosystem. So um, like if you get too many urchins in a kelp forest, they can actually eat all the kelp. Okay? And it can become what's called an urchin barren. So all the kelp's gone, kelp forest is gone. Now you just have lots of urchins. Okay? So they can actually throw off the, the ecological balance. Um, sea urchins and also some sea stars are used for embryological research because they have large eggs. They're easier to see and you know not as many um, ethical issues with testing on sea stars and sea urchins. We're using them for drug research. And then how many of you have ever had uni? Okay. Uni is um, sea urchin gonad. So it is the reproductive organs of a sea urchin. All right, that's what you ate. Doesn't it sound lovely? Okay, that's it. 